Thank you very much for inviting me. Very happy for an opportunity to visit CTU. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Honestly, wasn't expecting to get this from uh, public policy and otherwise I thought uh, social sciences and uh, psychology departments. Um, and it's, it's nice that we, we get Hong Kong departments across universities to talk to one another, especially with open science. I've been hoping for more opportunities to find people like myself who care about open science and are trying to promote this. Uh, I, I admit that I don't know much about uh, public policy and uh, uh, things that are going on at, at CDU, uh, but I'm hoping that this would be both a teaser for you to see a little bit of what it is that we do, but also uh, jumpstart some kind of a collaboration for us to work together uh, in Hong Kong and beyond. There's a community going cross-discipline, uh, getting as many people involved as, as possible. Um, everything that I'm going to talk about today is downloadable, not only this uh, workshop, but also uh, other workshops uh, that I've given before. So you can see on the main slide over here, there's this URL um, that you can follow or the scan the QR code. Be, uh, just below that, you can see it says cloud folder. This is a workshop that I gave about a month ago about a similar topic, uh, which was about three hours. So it has that video and it has also some of the materials of things that I did over there. I had a little bit more time, so I demonstrated how to do a pre-registration and how to share things on the Open Science Framework. Um, so uh, if you want, you can just go on this uh, other cloud folder link and then from that follow on and, and see everything of what it is that we've done. Uh, a lot of the slides that I, I'll be using uh, today come from very active uh, members in the open science movement. And I think one of the great things about this open science movement is that we really share everything. So we share the presentations, uh, the materials, the, you know, it's not just about research, but it's also about the, um, you know, the, the dissemination, then get the public engagement. Uh, so I really encourage you that if you want to know a little bit more about that, go and check. Uh, the, the slides and the materials from these from these people it's really inspiring stuff and it makes my work a lot easier as I prepare to uh, talk to you about things in addition if you want to uh, take part in our, our workshops everything that I do is uh, available since we started with the zoom semesters I thought might as well record everything and put this on on uh, YouTube so uh, pre-registrations uh, and register reports which I'll be talking about today there's a whole workshop uh, two and a half hours uh, on YouTube. Uh, we've been trying to um, kind of let go of SPSS, Stata, and uh, SAS and all that and move to R. Uh, some people find this challenging, therefore I uh, uh, use Jamovi and JASP, which look like SPSS, but they run on R. <clears throat> and they're actually very good open source, uh, run, you know, everything is, is open and shared, and, and, and they allow people who are addicted to SPSS and such to make the transition. So you're just welcome to, um, to check out any, any of these resources. All of my talks, everything that I uh, do is, is uh, shared. So you can go and check uh, that out. It started from me talking about my journey to open science in Brazil a year ago, where I got stuck from uh, the, when the pandemic hit. And since then, I've, uh, I've tried to uh, document everything that I do. So if you wanna know more about my journey, how I came to do open science, I'll talk a little bit about that today, <clears throat> but there's much more on, on YouTube if, if you wanna do, uh, go, go deeper into that. Some of the amazing people uh, that I follow that have helped uh, whose slides I used uh, are these uh, folks over here. And you can see the titles of these talks is like easing into open science. So let's say you find it difficult uh, and you don't, you're not sure how to start, you can uh, follow these presentations. Uh, some people are like, why would I want to do open science? What's in it for me? So selfish reasons to uh, do open science. Um, let's say that you're an early career, how to do that and, and so forth. So uh, some really inspiring presentations by other in the open science community. Uh, in addition, I won't show it to you now because we're limited on time, but I have a page on my website about open science. Uh, what is this replication and reproducibility crisis? Why do we need a credibility revolution? So if you want to know more about that, I'll touch on this very briefly at the moment uh, in, this, in this presentation. 
But uh, if you want to know more about that, some funny videos over there, if you know John Oliver and a few others who discussed the, the uh, open science uh, movement, why it's needed, uh, then please go on this uh, website. Lots of resources over there, including uh, books, podcasts, and uh, courses and videos and everything that you might need in order to become more familiar with these topics. Um, what is open science? What we'll be uh, touching on today? So very briefly, as a broad uh, kind of category of open science, people have different definitions of open science. Uh, some people say, why do we need open in uh, you know, open science? Science should be open by default, therefore just call it science. Uh, but when we talk about this umbrella of open science, typically we refer to a lot of subcategories. Uh, today I will touch upon uh, mainly uh, these over here, which have to do with uh, uh, open process, so documenting every decision that you've done, starting from the research question, how did you come to this research question, and how you developed the research question, and how you followed up on this, getting to the hypothesis. But then, of course, when it comes to if we're talking about quantitative um, ex experiments, uh, studies, uh, then we have uh, data, we have materials, we have code. So making all that open is part of open science. For some reason, uh, Currently, the standards are not to share things, and hopefully that's uh, transitioning a lot uh, to do with the open science movement that's been trying to push this uh, forward. Uh, part of this is pre-registrations, uh, moving to something called registered reports. Uh, some people don't know what the difference is between pre-registrations and registered reports, so I'll talk about why registered reports are uh, the future of science. Uh, they should have been science to begin with, but now we understand uh, we need to structure things better when it comes to the publication process of sending pre-registrations to peer review before data collection. And that's what we've been doing um, recently in the last two, three years, uh, I've been doing this with my students. Uh, reproducible analysis, not just that you are able to run your own, but also make sure that, that everything is commented, that everything uh, can be run by others. Let's say that you come back to this code in 10 years where you're whatever it is that you use, Jamovi, R, Jasp, uh, it has a different version. Would you be able to reproduce everything and understand what it is that people did 10 years ago? So not just that everything works right now, but you know, in the long term, plus having other people check your code. So it's not just it works for me, therefore everything is fine, but having you know, other people look at this. So uh, right now there are all sorts of movements about red teams to try and kind of like go and find weaknesses. Uh, have you analyzed everything? Have you taken into consideration uh, um, you know, all the assumptions and so forth. Replications, this is a big part of what I've been doing at HKU and I'll talk about replications. Uh, plus open peer review and assessments of methods and rigor. Um, we need to structure better the way that we do uh, our evaluations of uh, science in general. Uh, there's a lot of trust, which I think uh, we've shown that we're not uh, worthy of. Uh, we need to structure everything. So we should know what happened to this manuscript. Well, while it went through peer review, what did the reviewer say to be able to go back and see some of the comments and also to be able to assess published and unpublished uh, research in terms of their methods, their rigor, his theory, solid, and so forth. Uh, other things that I will, will not be touch, uh, touching on are things like open access, big topic, lots of challenges over there, systematic uh, issues uh, that we have not tackled in Hong Kong. I think the Scandinavians and Netherlands and more recently the European Union uh, with Plan S has done stuff on that, but that's a whole different issue. I have some resources on that if you're interested. So. For me personally, since I became an assistant uh, professor at HKU in the psychology department, I've focused on these three broad categories, replications and extensions, science assessments, and community resources. I will talk a little bit about my personal journey. So I consider myself to be an early career researcher. Uh, I've had to make some tough decisions uh, as, as a postdoc uh, and a PhD student but what I do with my career, what do I want my career to look like? So I'm going to share uh, this to you as like my journey as an early career researcher, trying to make sense of what's going on and trying different things in order to understand what's, uh, um, what I can do to contribute to open science and open science uh, uh, movement to better and improve science overall. Um, I just want to say these three, domains, I'll come back to that at the end, I'm not doing this on my own. So each one of these domains 
I do with students. And we're talking about students as early as second year undergraduates. So we work together, we write manuscripts together, we submit this to journals together, and we publish. And I'll show you some of the uh, published research with undergraduates based on what uh, we do in my courses. I don't know how familiar everybody is with what's happening in science right now. So I'm going to skip at the beginning to the end and tell you my summary of the situation. Then I'll tell you what it is that I did based on my summary of the situation. And only halfway through, I will tell you why I think this situation is like that. What I want to say is that regardless of what it is that you think about what's happening in science right now, do you think that there is a, a replication reproducibility crisis or not, if there's a need for credibility revolution or not, I really like these two slides. And uh, this originally, the, the, this cartoon was about climate change. So people are talking about things like energy independence, preserve the rainforest, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, and all this. And then somebody goes up, uh, yells, and says, what if it's all a big hoax and we created a better world for nothing? Uh, I see the same thing about uh, open science. Even if you disagree with me on the situation of science right now, um, I like this, it's like when we're talking about data, data sharing, uh, reducing publication bias, improving the use of statistics, increasing transparency and all this, sometimes I give talks about open science and people are saying, but what if it's all a big hoax, there's no replication crisis and all this, and we just create a better science for nothing. So my main message is, yes, let's create a better science. Let's just improve things. You can't, you can't say anything against wanting to to improve. So let's self-reflect, reassess, and try to see what can we do in our science practices in order to improve the way that we do uh, science. My general take, uh, I try to summarize this. So we're talking about, I was in Maastricht University as a, a postdoc. This is 2016. I had, uh, for the first time, independence to sit down with myself and decide what do I want, my understanding of the situation is that something is going on, what do I want my research to look like? And I set up these principles and I try to live by them. And I think it's really important for you as an early career researcher, any, any stage career, to pause for a second, sit, look at the literature, look at the challenges, look at everything that's happening and then tell yourself, what is it that I want to achieve? Um, so in, in a lot of places like HKU, like, like other universities, the main thing that you keep hearing is, you know, number of publications or impact factors and all that. But if we kind of put, put aside all the external pressures and try to focus as to what, what, what do we want to achieve, you know, so down the road when I uh, retire, look back at my career, what would have I, I wanted to achieve? So I want to achieve trustworthiness, reproducibility and replicability in my own findings. And I set these principles for myself. This is nothing new. I just took a bunch of things from different people in the open science community. And I summarized this for myself so that I can put this on my wall and remember, this is what I want to achieve. Uh, this is not taken for granted. So even this first line over here, simplicity over complex models, Actually, I do not come from psychology. I did my PhD in management in the business school. And over there, very much theory-driven, complex models, moderation, mediation, multi-level, 30 errors in different directions. I'm putting all this aside. I'm focusing on simplicity, uh, preferably main effects, perhaps uh, an interaction, because we understand now that each one of you know, these complex models need to be compensated. They need to have the right power in order to investigate these sort of things. And it's, it's not easy to achieve uh, these large samples or this uh, you know, the design for that. So we need to start simple and then build from that. So you can start simple by main effect and then add an interaction. And then if everything is solid so far and you have large enough samples and you can test this, then you go to complex models. So it includes all sorts of things like power, analysis, do you have a large enough uh, sample? Um, but uh, it goes far beyond that. So we have this obsession in science with this p-value. So p-value lower than 0 0.05. Why 0 0.05, what, not anything else? What makes uh, 0 0.049 better than 0 0.051? So this very arbitrary uh, p-value needs to be put aside in order to focus more on a continuous evaluation in terms of effect size, confidence intervals, looking at something as uh, not a dichotomy of 
uh, support or no support, but just like looking at it, quantifying the kind of support, how strong is the effect? Uh, register reports and pre-registration. So I decided back in 2016 that I will pre-register everything that I can. And uh, when register reports started coming out that I'll try and do more register reports and I'll talk uh, what those are. Findings are findings. So it's impossible to have a literature that's 90 plus percent positive results um, we have a lot of file drawer, so we need to open everything. So whatever it is that I do, regardless of whether p-value is lower than 0 0.05 or not, I'm going to share a lot of replications. I'm going to share everything as preprints, uh, and I want to form a sense of community and collaboration where we, we exchange everything and share everything transparently. But number one, and this is why it's bolded, is to have full transparency about everything that we do. So not only are we sharing our materials, our data, and our code, but we're sharing the entire process including our failures, including all the decisions that we've made, the exclusions, the conditions, all the variables. So anybody could see starting from the beginning of the projects until the end where you've, you've wrapped it up, what happened throughout that project. So documenting all of this is very, very important. Um, another big change that, that I did, I was uh, surprised and uh, very happy to hear that you are doing some stuff on judgment decision making in public policy and cognitive biases and all that. I sat down with myself and even though I've done a lot of things before 2016, uh, I wanted to, to uh, try and decide. So of all the research that I've um, looked at, what seems to be like the most solid? And I have to say that uh, Kahneman, Tversky, everything that came uh, since it's a Nobel Prize winning uh, work uh, seemed the most solid to me. So I said, I'm gonna put everything that I've done prior to that aside, and I'm going to go into a new domain of judgment and decision-making, and I'm gonna try and focus on that. This was an intuition. I had no evidence for that. So I decided to try and find my own systematic evidence in support of this intuition. I wanted to make sure before I embark on judgment and decision making, I wanted to know that this is solid. How to do this? So 2017, after I decided to, you know, what are my principles and what domain I want to focus on, I decided I will only work with students on one of two things. Either I will do pre-registered replications plus extensions. So first of all, I will start from what I think is a solid phenomena. I will try and replicate this, and then perhaps I will add something to it that will not harm the replications. Or on the other side, I'm going to do pre-registered meta-analyses. Um, so I think we have a lot of meta-analyses, but meta-analyses tend to be a lot of uh, biases inherent in meta-analysis in the way that we choose studies, in the way that we do exclusions, in the way that we choose moderators. So we need to pre-register meta-analysis just as we uh, pre-register any other quantitative um, research and we now have templates in it for both of these so if you want to know how to do a pre-registered replication or pre-registered meta-analysis uh, we have some great resources for you and i'll talk a little bit about that down down the road so not an easy decision to focus on this and actually when i told my department in maastricht you know a postdoc coming in and saying this is what i'm gonna do uh, some people said nobody would want to work with you and to some extent they would uh, they were right uh, only three uh, letter came, so four students, only four students wanted to work with me. Uh, but the interesting thing is that nobody else wanted to work with me, only these four students, you know, they could uh, give a priority of uh, three researchers, but the ones that wanted to work with me gave me as the first priority. So they were really into, uh, you know, this direction of trying to understand what's going on in the literature and doing open science. And I have to admit, 2017, perhaps like some of you, I had no idea what it means to do open science. I was completely lost. Um, and when I, uh, you know, they came to a lab session with me and said, okay, great. So let's do open science, how to do this. I said, actually, I don't know. I don't know how to do replications. I don't know how to do pre-registrations. Let's figure this out together. Um, so this is what we did. I want to explain a little bit why I made this kind of uh, decision, not only for the decision back then, but also for the decision of what it is I do in my, in my projects is that replications and extensions offer a lot of benefits. So if you're a student or an early career going into a new domain, 
I really recommend that you start from a replication or a replication and extension. First of all, it's practical because you know, you've got the original article. So uh, it's uh, something that you just need to follow a very clear process of analyzing this, you know, looking at all the effect sizes, um, power analysis, writing the pre-registration, and then following exactly the same process. So there's less uncertainty, less, you know, you need to uh, come up with something out of nowhere. So it's uh, pretty straightforward, and it's also fairly easy, at, at least in judgment and decision making, to do uh, data collection. It's very measurable because you have the original article and then you have the replication, you can compare between them. And then on top of that, you have the extension. So you can see what it is that you've added to a replication. So let's say you do novel research as a researcher, and then it didn't work out. You didn't find support for that, what it is that you hypothesized. Why didn't it work? It didn't work because of you. You did something wrong. Perhaps it's the material. Perhaps you're based on a phenomena or a theory that doesn't have support. So how to tease these apart? If you do a replication plus extension, then you know what didn't work. Perhaps the replication worked, but the extension didn't. And then you just know, okay, so at least I'm based on a solid phenomena. I'll just do a different extension. Um, and then it, it could be you know, that the replication uh, didn't work. And then you, you learn something. You learn something about the original, the original phenomenon. It's very systematic. Whatever you find is valuable. Even if there are no findings, people would say it's very important for us to know that this, let's say, prospect theory or something in judgment decision making doesn't replicate. We want to know this kind of thing because these are, are very impactful. Um, and then it's very instructive. So students can learn a lot from that. And to be honest, uh, I can learn a lot from that. So I can learn from seeing how my students are tackling this sort of thing. We focus on rigor rather than novelty. We focus on process rather than the outcome. So really allows us to practice open science in a more uh, you know, solid, systematic way with the students. I'm gonna give you an example. This is a classic. Uh, I'm guessing that if you do cognitive biases, uh, public policy and all this, this definitely applies. Norm theory basically says that we have reference points and things are, um, everything is, compared to a reference point. And Kahneman and Miller, uh, back in 1986, had um, this classic experiment about exceptionality effects. So you have two people, uh, one of them gives uh, hitchhikers rides all the time and one of them doesn't. And then both of them just happen to take a hitchhiker one day and they get robbed. And the question is, which one of those is going to regret taking a hitchhiker more? Um, and the main finding is that the person who deviated, so if they don't take a hitchhiker, and then that one day they took a hitchhiker, so this is an exceptional behavior, and it led to something negative, they're going to regret, regret this more, because if they take hitchhikers every day and they get robbed, it's like, okay, I just took another, you know, it doesn't happen very often. So there's something, something about exceptionality and uh, negative outcomes that leads to regret. Very simple, one uh, paragraph vignette. Uh, I started with something as simple as possible and wanted to see, does this replicate? Uh, Lucas Kutcher over here was the master student who decided to join with me on this. And I really recommend that if you start from a replication and extension, take a study, preferably a classic study with a lot of impact, as simple as possible. So one vignette, very simple manipulation. Was it exceptional or was it routine? And then, and then see if you can replicate uh, that. So we took two of these exceptionality effect uh, replications uh, and we tried to uh, build on that. So we had a hitchhiker scenario, a car accident scenario, and we had a robbery scenario. Now, the interesting thing that about the second one is that rather than measuring regret, uh, who is going to regret more, which is what norm theory was about, it measured compensation. So what kind of compensation would you give the person who got robbed? Uh, if it was in a, a routine store that a person shops or an exceptional store where somebody shops. And, and Lucas came to me and he said, you know, it's really weird that they use compensation DV because it's not what norm theory is about. Norm theory is about counterfactuals or regret. So I don't understand why they use compensation. I said, okay, so first of all, we do a replication. We do it exactly as they did it but we're going to add an extension. So after you complete the replication, you move to the next page, then add regret and see what happens. And it's a really interesting case study because when we ran this, actually uh, the norm theory, the original thing replicated, but the compensation did not replicate. So we were a little bit confused by this. 
Um, then we have to get, so what happens with the extension? And the interesting thing is that when we actually measured regret rather than compensation, then we found out that it was supported. So Lucas came in with something that was closer to the theory and then showed that if you measure compensation, things, uh, you know, the effect is much weaker and it's not detectable. Uh, but if you measure regret, which is what the theory was exactly about as an extension, actually you find that extension. And later we were talking to the, you know, the original authors and people doing uh, research in this domain and people are saying, yes, I know, I also ran compensation and it didn't work out. And then I said, but where is it, where is it published? H how would I know? This was in 1986. A lot of people were trying compensation and they said, yeah, we submitted this to the journal, but the journal said it, it didn't come out. Uh, you know, it was a no, no finding. Therefore, we're not going to accept this for publication. So just imagine from 1986 all the way to 2017 until Lucas decided to do this, all the people that tried to run compensation and couldn't find support for, for this. But if you use this with regret, then suddenly things work out. So I thought this was absolutely brilliant. So this was a really a good case study after which I was convinced that this, this is a good way to do my, uh, my research. Now, Lucas at the beginning, together with two other students, you know, they came to my lab meeting and they said, is anybody going to be interested in our replication? And I said, honestly, I have no clue. I don't know if this is publishable. Let's do it this way. Just go on ResearchGate, which is kind of like a Facebook for academics. And tell the ResearchGate community that we're going to do this. And Lucas did this. So he went on ResearchGate and he wrote, the aim of this project is to conduct a pre-registered replication and a meta-analysis on exceptionality effect. And this was, as you can see, February 11, 2017. We started working on this. We still did not have a pre-registration, still no data collection. A month later, so we're talking about March, Sandra Kuhl from uh, VU uh, Amsterdam wrote to uh, Lucas as a comment on ResearchGate. He said, Dear Lucas and Gilad, at Cognition and Emotion, we are seeking to publish more pre-registered research. Please consider Cognition and Emotion an outlet for this project. And I was, I was just blown away by this. So Lucas and the others are like, oh my God, we're going to get published in Cognition and Emotion. I said, hold on. You know, there's a very long way from a comment on ResearchGate until you get published. But it's a good sign that people are curious about this. People want to know this, this kind of thing. And uh, I wasn't really sure if they're going to, uh, you know, make it happen or not. But they did live up to this. We, you know, we submitted this to Cognition and Emotion. We got uh, uh, one of the open science um, uh, leaders as the editor. And finally, you can see Lucas uh, and I, uh, you know, we have, we have a replication, an extension uh, publication. So, so um, I realized this is also publishable and there are editors out there who want to publish more of these things, but can't find people who are doing replications. They're so, they're, <laughs> they're so desperate to get us that they're going on ResearchGate and commenting on master's students posts on ResearchGate in order to get them to submit uh, replications and extensions to their journal. So you got you got to wonder about this. People are saying, you know, it's not going to get published, but there's a real thirst for these kinds of things uh, to happen. Not only with Lucas, he also did this with Tijen and he did this with Yajin. He went to my students and wrote, please submit, please submit. And finally, we were able to uh, publish all of this work, not in cognition and emotion. I actually wanted to see how broad this is. So we tried other journals and, and we were able to do this also with a meta-analysis. So Lucas did a pre-registered replication and extension plus a pre-registered meta-analysis. And it's, it's quite amazing because actually when we summarized uh, the literature, you can see that the effect for regret is a lot higher than the effect for compensation. So actually when you, compensation does work, a norm theory can be applied to compensation as well, but you need to account that the compensation has other things in it. Therefore, it's not uh, only just about regret. It has other things that have to do with blame and responsibility. Therefore, the effect size is much weaker. So doing a pre-registered replication and extension allows you to gain amazing insights about you know, what works in terms of theory, effect sizes, but as a you know, complementary to that, doing a pre-registered meta-analysis, summarizing the literature, getting people to share what they have in their file drawers allows you to uh, gain additional insights. And then not only about compensation and regret, but by going beyond that. And this 
uh, also was published in cognition and emotion, you know, as a separate as a separate manuscript. So just imagine a one year master's student in, in, in Maastricht University who at the beginning had no clue what he was going to do with me, uh, ended up uh, with uh, these two publications plus another publication as a review paper uh, based on this. So I just realized to my great shock that first of all, I gain amazing insights from that. And second, this is also publishable so it can you know, be disseminated to, uh, to everybody. Plus you can see in the abstract, I also started doing this uh, thing about at the end of the abstract, I would add all materials are available on. And unfortunately with meta-analysis and experiments and, and all this, it's very difficult to, to get to the data. Plus a lot of people don't have access to the actual article. So if you add in your abstract where everything is, then people who only have access to the abstract can go on your OSF and then find everything. So um, very, very important practice that we've been doing since 2017, just add your open science framework to your abstract. So if you want to see me demonstrate live how to do pre-registrations, please go on this uh, uh, YouTube later on and watch uh, how it is that I do this. It's very, very simple. Some people think that OSF is uh, very complicated, the pre-registrations are very complicated. They're really not, especially if you've thought about things already. It's just a matter of putting them down. And once you have one template and you've done research in this domain, it's a lot of copy paste, adding a few things, taking out a few things. But pre-registrations, you know, if my second year undergraduate students in my courses can do a pre-registration, uh, I, I think really anybody, anybody can. And the amazing thing that I've learned from my students is that actually the students do a lot better than I ever did in my postdoc. So some of these pre-registrations are 50 pages long. Um, now in all of our pre-registrations, we also uh, simulate data and run our data analysis on the simulated data. So there's nothing, you know, when, when the data collect, uh, collection ends, we just run it through the script and immediately the, the manuscript updates, you know, with our markdown. So actually you spend a lot of time on the pre-registrations, but then after data collection, it takes five minutes for the entire manuscript to be updated with the real, with the real results. And then it's just writing the discussion. So I've learned a lot from my students doing these kinds of things. And you can see a little bit about that uh, over here. So back then I was uh, thinking, okay, so this went above and beyond expectations. I did not, uh, you know, my biggest fantasy, I didn't expect things to go that well with all of my master's students as a postdoc in master's university. But then I had this dilemma. I'm going to become an assistant professor. Hopefully the job market will allow me to, you know, uh, get into a tenure track. Uh, how can I do more of this? And I don't want to do this uh, one, two, three students. Uh, if it will just be like that, it would take us decades to tackle everything in judgment and decision-making. I really want to grow, do this uh, large scale, involve as many people as possible uh, in the community. So uh, in order to uh, do that, I. I really want to do as many replications as possible, involve as many people as possible, maximize impact and also minimize the errors, especially when you work with students, especially when you work with undergraduate second year, you know, maybe they ran a t-test, maybe ANOVA, you know, best case. How do you minimize errors? So that's when I decided to reach out to early career researchers. I would say uh, early career researchers, the way that I categorize them is starting from research postgraduate, so let's say MPhil, PhD uh, through postdocs to first, second, third year assistant professor, open up and share everything that I have uh, with others. This is uh, the model that we uh, work with. So I decided I've moved myself all the way to the end as a corresponding author. So I decided everything that I'm going to do full credit to students. It doesn't matter uh, how early they are, even if they're students. Uh, but because um, I can only tackle uh, two, three of those uh, in, in you know, any given time, I'm going to do projects with students and then I'm going to invite early career researchers to take the lead. So they will verify everything that the students do. They will add their own analysis. So, so for example, Bayesian analysis or, or whatnot. 
and then I will give them the lead and they will take us through all the, you know, revise and resubmit, addressing everything. And as you can see over here, so this is me, these are my master's university students. Uh, so I talked about Yajin and uh, Tijen. So finally, we published this in Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, which is a, a, good, a good outlet in social psychology. And then I invited these early career researchers to take the lead. And then there's, in a note, it, it says, shared first co-author. So all of us are uh, first authors, but the way that I structured this is that, and this is really important for you to understand how did we do what it is that we've done in the last uh, year or so in terms of the impact that I'm going to show you. Um, before we move on, I just want to give you kind of a summary of what it is uh, about my journey in Maastricht University as a postdoc deciding to, to go for this. If you're contemplating doing something uh, similar, I suggest that you uh, just do something hands-on. So rather than thinking, you know, maybe I need to learn a lot about open science and I need to attend some courses and I need to, you know, read a lot about that. Don't just start doing this hands-on. Find one project, hopefully your next project, choose one and just try things out on that. I actually decided to put everything that I, I did on hold and only focus on this. And if you don't have enough time uh, on, on your own, then use your time with graduate students, uh, guided students. Even my students, there's two MPhil students that are working with me. Um, I tell them, you know, when you guide your undergraduate students as teaching assistants, research, research assistants, then start your next projects with that. So you don't have to change immediately everything that you do. You can start with the next project or with your next student um, to, to go into and try hands-on open science. And then where to start? I really recommend a replication as simple as possible, vignettes, simple uh, manipulation. Start from that, add extensions, grow, build foundations, and then uh, move move from uh, uh, from that. Key ingredients for a successful execution of this, and I think this is the only uh, reason why I was able to scale up as much as I did, is 2016-17, not a lot of examples. 2021, a lot of examples. You can look at all the examples from our projects. We have templates for everything. So templates are a big uh, ingredient in the success of undergraduates being able to do this. We have a lot of guides, a lot of videos. Uh, Jamovi and JASP in 2017 were not uh, good enough tools, but we were able to work together with the developers. They're usually responsive, you know, they're on Twitter. Within a day or two, we would get a fix or an additional component and add on for something that we needed. They're very, very responsive. Um, so, um, we use this as kind of like a first base in order to transition them completely uh, into, into R and then build collaboration, share your preprints and, and so forth. Now I'm gonna pause before I tell you about our project at HKU and how we were able to uh, do everything uh, that we did. I'm just gonna very briefly say that um, this, this year, this academic year, we've summarized a hundred replications and extensions of the JDM uh, literature. Um, before I share a little bit of how we were able to accomplish this, you know, in, in two, three years, uh, how to do these hundred uh, replications and extensions with undergraduates, uh, I'm going to take you a step back and talk about the situation. Um, so if you remember the previous uh, slide about my summary of the situation, what is the situation? And what brought me in 2016 to reflect on everything, put everything that I do on hold and decide that I want to invest in this? So. 2011, uh, something happened in uh, psychology. Uh, two main things, I will not go into them. There was one big scandal uh, in Tilburg University with the Didrik Stapel uh, fraud, ma massive fraud that until now we're trying to kind of uh, battle. Another thing that happened is that there was a famous uh, finding published in one of our best journals, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology about evidence for uh, people being able to feel the future, which is an impossible finding. And just the fact that there's something like that, evidence for something that is impossible was published in one of our top journals, really gave people a uh, pause and uh, really reflect if they were able to publish support for something that we know is impossible, um, then some, something must be wrong. And then came out a series of studies about false positive psychology and so forth. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I give a whole course. Everything is on YouTube. You can go in and check that. But 
2011, we decided perhaps if these things are able to publish <clears throat> uh, both fraud and things that are impossible and somehow supported by the best standards, the best evidence that we have in statistics, you know, using our best tools in statistics, perhaps other things in the literature are not reliable. How would we know if they're reliable or not? We should run mass replication. So 2012. 12, 2013, psychology, social psychology started doing uh, mass scale replication projects. And in 2015, things started to come out. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing my first postdoc in the US, I'm sitting there and looking at all these results come out and I'm just like shocked about all sorts of things where I can't, I, you know, things that we're taking for granted, things that we do TED Talks on, things that we wrote books uh, on, every textbook in social psychology, when you open up, you know, things like uh, embodiment, things like ego depletion, uh, uh, self-control is a limited resource, elderly priming, you know, priming literature every, everywhere in the, in the textbooks. So one by one, these uh, things come out and all the replications are failures. And especially uh, this one with uh, ego depletion. So during my PhD for, uh, you know, in the middle of my PhD, I exchanged to a lab that specialized uh, in this in, in Florida state. So I was a strong uh, believer in uh, ego depletion. Hundreds of, of uh, um, you know, articles, citations. It's one of the most prolific lines of literature in social psychology. What do you mean ego depletion doesn't replicate? How is this even possible? I really don't, didn't understand. Um, and if you, you know, look at the videos from my course, I share some of the experiences with people that I know and care about, about the big shock and disappointment about how one of the strongest findings of social psychology in the last two decades fails to replicate. So all these things started to coming out really uh, we, we wanted to understand why, why is this happening? How, how could it be? So biggest thing I think that gave social psychology the biggest shock was the science paper in 2015, where they tried to replicate a hundred of classic findings in uh, psychological science, JPSP, other kinds of, of things. Plus there was uh, many labs one, many labs two, many labs three, all these mass replication projects and at the end, if you can see the summary over here. So Brian Nosek, these are his tweets, is the founder of the Center of Open Science. They are the ones that did the platform of uh, Open Science Framework. And he summarized across six large scale replication projects. The replication rate seems to be 90 out of 190, about 47%. And in the ones that replicated, the effect size of what was published was about half of the original. Some people said, okay, psychological science, JPSP, these are social psychology journals, so maybe not so solid, but if you go to nature and science, then things are replicable. Actually, we try to replicate social psychology uh, findings from uh, science and nature. Exactly the same uh, things, uh, about half you know, uh, replicates, and in the ones that replicate, it's about half the effect uh, size. So large scale replication efforts indicating that about half of our findings are not replicable. Some people said, that's, that's not a problem. That's actually higher than we expected. For me, for a lot of people that I know, it depends what your reference point is. Um, this was a big, a big shock. Just imagine that you open a textbook and just like half of the things that you read in that textbook are, are, not, are not solid. But since then, We've done a lot more of this. So one of our top journals, Perspectives of uh, Psychological Science, now it's AMPPS, so Advanced Methods and Practices in Psychological Science, started doing about all sorts of things and a lot of failures. Almost everything that we've done about uh, priming uh, fails, embodiment seems to fail, all sorts of things, even classic things about moral judgment seems to fail. Very, very disheartening. Um, my summary of uh, right, what's happening right now in social psychology is the replication rate seems to be between 30 to 50 percent. And of what replicates, the effect seems to be about half of what was originally uh, published. Now, the immediate reactions to all of this, especially coming from uh, other fields, are like, oh, yeah, of course, psychology. It's not really a science. It's a weak science. If it's a science, it's the science of blah, blah. We didn't expect much from psychology. Therefore, of course, nothing replicates. But if you try and run these 
with exact sciences. If you try to do this in other domains, then you'll see that you know, our science is solid. Unfortunately, since 2015, other fields have uh, started to try and replicate things. And if anything, it looks a lot worse than in social psychology. So you can see all these big headlines that are started coming out. So chemical research, uh, you know, economics, cancer, cancer, cancer research is broken. So, you know, if social psychology, judgment and decision-making stuff doesn't replicate, you know, one policy perhaps uh, uh, um, not, wasn't that different from another, but if cancer research treatments, you know, people suffer, people die. So if this is not just psychology, if this is a science problem, then we really need to look uh, very, very deeply and reassess our science practices. Um, the last two, so this one is from August, 2020, empirical computer science. Can you imagine something that's more, <laughs> it's as close as you can get to math, you know, algorithms and stuff that doesn't uh, reproduce very well. The last one that I saw in April, 2021, people said physics, physics that replicates everything. Everything is okay. No, <laughs> so we have quantum, quantum physics also has a problem. Uh, I read these things and I'm kind of just like blows, blows my mind away. I've been tracking these things for more than seven years. And every time one of these headlines comes out, it just, uh, it, it, it worries me, worries me deeply. So just imagine, you know, now we're in a pandemic. We're trying to deal with, with uh, one of the biggest challenges um, that, that we've ever uh, had, at least in you know, my, my life as an adult. Uh, trying to tackle this this pandemic raging, uh, and you want to assess vaccines, you want to assess treatments. Just imagine that you can't trust things, and you don't know what replicates. Um, so we're, we're talking about hu human suffering, uh, human life, um, very very, very you know, disheartening findings. My summary of the very little evidence that we have right now about replications in the exact sciences is the following. I have to say initial because we don't have a lot of evidence, but just look at these rates. So if we have 30 to 50% in the social sciences, we're talking about you know, neuroscience. The, the biggest one right now is cancer biology where they're, they've tried to do this on 50 classic cancer treatments and they've only been able to start with uh, 18 because 32 of those, they weren't even able to re reproduce the, the materials or the treatments or what it is that, that goes on because our papers are so brief. And when you reach out to the original uh, authors, uh, they say all sorts of things about, we can share this and this is proprietary and we have a, a you know, patent or NDA and all sorts of things. They wouldn't share this sort of thing. So they could only start with 18, and out of the 18, they've completed 14 so far, and, and only nine of these replicated. Uh, and even then with effects much weaker than, than original. So each one of those, you can just like click on these links and follow, um, it, it's not looking good. It's looking even much worse for exact sciences than uh, social, social psychology uh, and psychology. So, um, you know, imagine as an early career researcher in 2016, seeing this whole thing. Sometimes when I go around the world, people are still not aware that this is going on. Uh, when I talk about open science, they say, well, why do you need this? And then I share this finding and say, we didn't realize that this is happening. Stuff is going on. So at the very least, make sure that you are knowledgeable about what's happening. I coming to HKU, going around the world, I could not imagine why we're not sharing this with our undergraduates. So some were saying, we need to protect our undergraduates before we know what's going on. We need to come up with solutions. But for me, it's like, these are going to be the future practitioners. These are the ones that are going over there setting policy. You know, so people are coming through our courses. If we teach them something in a textbook that is not reliable, does not replicate, then we're gonna be in a serious, uh, a serious problem when they implement things that could be harmful or, or not work at all. You know, At the very least, wasting uh, a lot of uh, money and time, but could also be hurtful, you know. Um, so open science in general, what is it and uh, how does this uh, address the, the situation? Um, so I, I really like this slide. Uh, open science is just science done right. Uh, sometimes when I teach this stuff to undergraduate, they look at me in shock and say, wait, you, 
this is not how science is. And I'm, I'm like, I, I'm really, I feel, feel very ashamed. And I say, I don't know why science is what it is right now. We really need to rethink everything that we've done. But if you ask the person, you know, the lay person in the street, our students, uh, what they would expect science, they would expect open science. They would expect sharing and validation and assessment and, and replications and, and all of that. So we just need to go back to the foundations and get our science to, to be right. Now, I also really like this uh, slide by Simin Vazir about our science became the science of incredible rather than the science of credible. So right now to get published in all this, papers are like advertisements. There's very little about the methods, nothing is shared. It's take my word for it, trust me that I know what I'm doing uh, where there's no reason for me to give trust because you've never shown me what it is that you've done. Um, a lot of things about reputation. So if I come from, let's say, Ivy League, uh, Princeton, uh, Stanford, then people think that I know what I'm doing as compared to other. Why, why is reputation and prestige? Um, why do we assume that nature science uh, publications are better? Did we ever assess this to really see that these are doing better uh, than others? Uh, we also have other inherent problems about, you know, the senior scholars are the ones that get all the glory. Early career researchers feel like they cannot participate or influence anything. Um, we have this obsession about novelty. Show us something new. Show us something new. If you just do a replication, people say nothing new. We knew this all along. Why do we ever, uh, even um, bother running a replication? Everything is significant. Of course, it cannot be significant because Science is messy, reality is messy. Some things work, some things don't work. Um, so it can't be that we have a, a literature where everything is significant. What happened to everything that's not significant? And it could be that for every one finding that is significant, we have 99 others that ran exactly the same thing but did not find anything. How would we know? We have no way of knowing whether it's one out of one or one out of 100. A lot of errors, very flashy uh, press releases, you know, everybody wants to publish their book or do their TED Talks or, 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 you know, whatnot. So we need to put this aside and understand that this is not sustainable. This is not science. Science needs to be credible, where you are transparent about everything, where you pre-register, where you tell people about your conflicts of interest. You know, I have a vested interest in this. So for example, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you have this magic treatment uh, uh, for COVID, uh, you need to, to be transparent about this rather than just submit this without declaring anything. All contributions are credited right now. You know, very few scholars um, get, get all the glory, but for every successful uh, principal investigator, uh, professor, there are research assistants, there are students, there are people who wrote the packages, who wrote the software, who wrote the code. Um, there's a lot of things, people who collected the data. So all of them need to be acknowledged, not just the one person who coordinated everything. Um, so people ask me, why do, you, why do you include your students as co-authors? They did the work, what do you mean? If, if anything, they should get all, all the credit uh, for things. I just coordinated things and, and guided them a little bit. So everybody needs to be acknowledged for what it is that they do. Um, all sorts of other things, a lot of things that we don't do, we don't do post-publication peer review, we don't do corrections. We need to move towards credibility. Now, one of the biggest um, uh, pr problems is uh, this paradox that we have about when we ask people is like, what part of research uh, do you think it should, you know, the scientists should not uh, control? Um, so obviously the results. So the researcher needs to design a study, you know, come up with hypothesis based on theory, but whatever the results are, we need to know the results. So the researchers should not be able to influence the results in order to meet whatever motivations for a top tier publication or p-value lower than 0 0.05. But then when you ask, you know, even in HKU everywhere, it's like, what do you need in order to get tenure? What part is most important for you advancing your career is the results. So how could it be that on one side, we can't touch the results, but then this is what we're evaluated against. There's a completely mismatched. So you can't touch the results, but make this amazing. And this is unsustainable. And then there's this in hand conflict between what's best for science. So what is best for science and humanity or overall uh, is high quality research published regardless of the outcome. We don't want high 
inside bias, outcome bias, and all this to affect our results. We don't have, we don't want researchers to play around with the results just to make this uh, more appealing than they really are. We want to know reality for what reality is. But then what's best for scientists is to produce a lot of great results, to have a lot of publications in top tier journals, unsustainable. When we look at this uh, research uh, cycle, so this is a very typical one, especially if you do quantitative uh, um, methods. So you have theory, you generate hypothesis, you design a study, you collect data, you analyze data, you interpret the data, and then you publish or you conduct the next experiment. The problem is, is that we have a lot of uh, problems here. Uh, we have a lack of replications um, when, when we you know, uh, generate uh, specify hypothesis, we have low statistical power, we have very selective reporting, some people call this questionable research practices or p-hacking, selective reporting, and then some people do something that's called harking, hypothesizing after the results are known, where they change the hypothesis to meet whatever the results were to begin with, and then of course we have publication bias and all that. How bad is it? Now we have data, we know. How many replications we have? Only one in a thousand papers has a replication. One in a thousand papers has a replication. What happened to the other 999? How do we know whether these are reliable or not? We don't. How about statistical power? So statistical power is very, very weak. If we look at all the JPSPs from 2011 and, and before psychological science, we had 10, 15, 20 in each condition. This is, <laughs> you can't detect anything with that. You need the coherence D of about one. Nobody, nobody, uh, there's very little phenomena in judgment, decision making, and social psychology that has a coherence D of one. Therefore, all of our studies, uh, you know, up to a certain point in time were, were underpowered. We didn't even know that power was important, but now we, we understand this is a big, a big issue. How many people do questionable research practices back then in 2012? 50 to 100 percent of people report at least one questionable research practices. Uh, problem with publication bias, 92 percent of uh, everything that's published is positive, p-value lower than 0 0.05. Impossible. How to, how to battle this? Lots of things that we can do about this, but I'm going to focus on one solution that has to do with a pre-registration and more specifically, registered reports. And I really encourage you, especially early career researchers, whenever you do something, uh, research um, that you're planning to do, let's say that you have four years of a PhD uh, and just do this as a registered report. How does the registered report uh, work? So traditionally, this is the publication uh, model. What it is that you do is that you develop an idea, you design a study, you collect the analysis data, write report, and publish the report. Uh, typically, you know, um, publish the report just comes after you've finished everything. Very, very high risk. Uh, you're not really uh, sure what's gonna uh, come, come out of that. And because of all the publication bias and all the gatekeepers, you're not really sure if what you're gonna, you know, find. Is, is gonna be publish, uh, publishable or not. Registered report uh, model has two stages. Uh, the first stage is peer review after you've designed the study. So you think of an idea, you design the study, you write a pre-registration and then you send this off to the journal. After some back and forth, both of you agree together with the editor and the reviewers, you agree on what's the best way to uh, tackle this. And because there are, there's no data, uh, if there's a problem, if there's an error, you just fix it, no problem. So there's no investment because nothing has been run yet. And reviewers, rather than criticizing you, just give you advice on how to improve things. Once you both agree, you, the reviewers, the editors, that everything is solid, they give you in principle acceptance. It means that after that, you go on data collection, whatever you find, positive results, negative results, you know, no findings, whatever you find, it's going to get published. So in principle acceptance means that whatever you do after the stage one peer review, it's gonna get published. So what is the second stage peer review? It's only to verify that you followed the pre-registration from stage one or that you document the deviation. So pre-registration is not a jail. You can deviate from that. The only thing that pre-registration does is to allow you to, uh, for maximum transparency. You've realized something is, is wrong, 
you've deviated, no problem. Just document the deviation from the stage from the stage one. So in stage one, the only uh, thing that people focus on is are your hypotheses uh, solid? Uh, are methods solid? Do you have enough power? So they assess in advance what is the best test for for uh, a theory, uh, plus whether they've accounted for everything that could happen. And, and it's a really collaborative effort. Uh, in our register reports, the reviewers actually gave us some amazing advice on how to improve what it is that we've suggested. In the second stage, the only thing is that did the authors follow the approved protocol? Did things work? You know, did they uh, account uh, for things? Uh, are the conclusions justified by the data? Are all the deviations documented? Now, I love this uh, pyramid by Chris Chambers. So Chris Chambers is the person who advocated, who started. Um, he was an editor in Cortex in 2013. He was the first to do this. Um, and there's another revolution coming up uh, right now. It's happening these days. Very exciting stuff on Twitter. But he had seven years to develop the concept of register reports. And I like this pyramid of open science evidence. Uh, what is the pyramid? So I agree with Chris Chambers saying status quo research, the stuff that's published right now, we don't know. We actually don't know whether this is reliable or not. We need to repeat this. We need to run these things again in order to know. And for Chris Chambers, he says barely worth a mention, should definitely not inform policy and should have a lot of you know, uh, warnings about we need to repeat this first. Open science, let's say that you have data and materials available. Uh, that's already a little bit better. But if you don't have a pre-registration, we consider this to be exploratory. So we don't know when were the hypothesis and the data analysis plan done. Was it done before data collection or after data collection? So we consider this exploratory. Confirmatory means that we know when the pre-registration happened and that it happened before data collection. And that's uh, one level up in terms of the, the how valuable this evidence is. But the best one that we have Right now, the best tool is a register report pre-registered with everything available and immune to publication bias because everything, um, it does not rely on the outcome. It only relies on you know, um, the, the rigor uh, and, and the theory uh, in the stage one uh, review. And finally, hopefully in a decade or so, we'll have a meta-analysis of registered reports. And finally, this should carry the most weight with policymakers and should be uh, receiving the most uh, media attention. Uh, I added a few of, of those. So I also think that meta-analyses should be registered reports. So a registered report, meta-analysis of registered reports is where we should be headed. And then some people say, you know, publishing a meta-analysis once in a decade or two is not good enough. We need to continuously update things. So Definitely, whenever something comes out, if you do this correctly, we'll immediately go into a meta-analysis, update this, and then practitioners, students, whoever is interested will know uh, up-to-date information uh, based on registered reports in our, our field. Why, what, what are the benefits? So we are addressing each one of the problems in this, in this cycle. So uh, if we're doing registered reports, there's no outcome bias. So we don't have this 92% positive anymore. Uh, it just eliminates each one of the uh, sections in this whole problem of what's happening in our science is addressed by registry report. And at the end, you have this green, clean uh, process, scientific process where things uh, are transparent, open, and much more uh, reliable. Um, all sorts of advantages about why to do this uh, in terms of uh, credibility. Uh, but I also, I really like this slide by Chris Chambers where he tries to explain for early career researchers, for you, researchers at any stage, why would you want to uh, do this? You would want to do registry reports because you get reviewer feedback, not just criticizing all the bad things that you've done, but in stage one, they give you valuable feedback so you can actually learn and grow. No one person is an expert in everything. And if the journal does a good job of getting some good reviewers, they would give you valuable research. It's like free advice that people with expertise spend you know, their time in order to help you improve, which is amazing. Our register reports um, process has been super positive. It's amazing the stuff that we've learned from our reviewers. Plus, if you see what uh, Chris Chambers did in Cortex, regular articles, 90% rejection rate. What's the rejection rate for register reports? Less than 10%. 
And, and there's no reason to reject anything uh, because anything can be addressed. If there's a problem, you just come up with a solution because you haven't collected the data yet. So there's no really reason to reject anything. In stage two, how many rejections? Zero. Zero percent rejections in stage two. So if you want to increase your chances of getting into the job market, getting publications, you know, meeting whatever requirements for tenure, go for registered reports because rather than you know submitting and hoping for the best with this 90% rejection rate, you're decreasing this to zero to 10%. Um, plus, and this is very true for our experience, most likely to be accepted in the first journal uh, that you submit to. Uh, it's usually a very fast uh, process, uh, two to four months in the stage one uh, review. The, the paper gets accepted before you conduct the research. So if you already have in principle acceptance, you go to a funding agency and says, this is going to be uh, published in a journal, just give me the funding. Then you don't have this uncertainty. Will this be published or not? Uh, funding agencies love this because they know this is going to get into a journal. Plus, the article is very well cited. So registered reports tend to be more cited than non-registered reports. So all sorts of, of, of benefits. Um, I've done a meta-analysis register reports with Krishna Savani in NTU in uh, Singapore. This is what he wrote to me when I asked him for some feedback. I'm not going to read all this to you. I'm just going to send it, uh, uh, summarize this uh, where he wrote. This is a rewarding research experience. So this was by far the most rewarding research experience that he has had. And he is an, an associate editor in JPSP, one of our best journals in social psychology. He's an accomplished professor who publishes a lot every year. And of all the things that he went through, register reports was uh, one of the most re rewarding um, experiences for him. Lots of clarity and there's no second guessing. Uh, I asked one of the MPhil students that are working with me, Chinyu, to reflect on this. Again, I'm not going to uh, go into the detail. I'm just going to tell you that for him, this process reduced uncertainty, um, gave him confidence to catch errors. It gave me peace of, peace of mind and saves time. He was able in one year of MPhil at HKU uh, to complete a register report. So some people say register report takes a lot of time. It does not. An MPhil student can, can do this. And now we're hoping, hoping that a few more will be uh, published. So in a two-year MPhil, especially if it's a four-year PhD, you can get these things accepted. So he recommends this for early career researchers as, as a path. Is there evidence? that registered reports are, are, are uh, good. Uh, we now have a lot of evidence for that. We didn't have this uh, before. Uh, I won't go into this in detail because we have a lot to talk about, but I summarized a lot of these for you. So you can see there's quite a lot of slides of all the evidence in support of registered reports and why it's uh, good for credibility and for science. So it's no longer Chris Chambers going around the world and saying, trust me, registered reports is the answer. We have, we have evidence. And I'm gonna get back to, so now that we've covered kind of like uh, the uh, issues, uh, what the situation is and what open science is with an example of registered reports, I'll tell you a little bit about HKU and what we've been doing. So if you recall, I finished my postdoc on Maastricht and I was looking for for a place uh, that would allow me to run this on a mass scale. So rather than me running this with uh, thesis students, uh, masters, I wanted to see whether I can run this with undergraduate students in my uh, courses. Uh, HKU, to my great surprise uh, and delight, uh, was willing to give me this kind of responsibility, which is why I decided to come back to Hong Kong uh, from the Netherlands. And, and start my journey here. Uh, they were, uh, gave me a lot of support and independence in trying these things out. And I'm very grateful uh, for that. And the things that we've achieved in the last two, three years are nothing short of remarkable. A lot to do with uh, the students who are amazing, the teaching assistants, and just the support from the environment to let us do this kind of uh, thing. So just to recap, uh, I had this model where uh, my guided thesis students then we submit stuff to the journals and then I invite early career researchers to take this with us to uh, journals. So my dilemma was coming to HKU, is it possible to do this uh, on a large scale um, replications and extensions? Second dilemma that I had was they gave me this textbook. This is social psychology textbook. Uh, please teach this. And um, like, I don't think I can do that because I don't know what's reliable in, in these findings. So rather than me just going and telling the students, this is the truth, I'm going to invite them on a journey to figure things out with me. Is 
you know, is this reliable or not? How did I do this? I relied on two uh, um, main publications, I would say, uh, Perspective of Psychological Science about how to teach replications in 2012, and two very inspiring um, projects, CREP and Psychological Science Accelerator. Right now, if you're an early career that does something related to psychology, so if you're doing stuff on cognitive biases, definitely and that's something that you can uh, submit to Psychological Science Accelerator. Let's say that you have this amazing hypothesis, you've designed the study, but you don't have data collection. Or you have data collection, but you want to run this in 20 countries. Submit this to Psychological Science Accelerator. They have 70 labs from around the world. And if they approve this, and right now they're very welcoming for uh, every everything, uh, 70 labs from around the world will collect data for you uh, based on what it is that you do. So it's an amazing project. It's changing the way that we do th stuff in social psychology. Uh, to me, uh, I love it that there are 70 labs from around the world, but I wanted to see if I can do stuff within my own courses in one lab at HKU. Um, so I thought these are great projects, but they're not enough for what it is that I need. Uh, another uh, thing that bothered me is that traditionally the way that things are is that, you know, we are um, standing in front of our classroom and then they tell them the truth is social priming or ego depletion or power posing. And this is not what uh, we should be doing with our students, especially when we don't know what's reliable and what's not. And I really like this book. I think again just came out by Adam Grant, um, a thinker in management and social psychology. And he talks in his chapter nine about teaching students to question knowledge. So rather than telling them, we know exactly everything that's what's happening and this is the truth, we need to bestow upon them a scientist mindset, be very humble, have humility about the scientific process. Uh, explain to them that confusion is natural, uncertainty is natural, science and reality are messy. And the way for us to figure things out is learning by doing hands-on together, looking at, uh, science, rather than just me telling them what's going on, uh, students can study informed science and teach me back. So I decided to adopt what I learned in Master of University about, about problem-based learning. So I give all the responsibility to the students. I let them run uh, real projects, uh, lead everything, work in, in groups, and, and seek out uh, the truth. So my principles were student-led, they do actual science, they run replications and extensions, they do real impact. We submit everything to the journals. Um, they do peer review on one another, they run pre-registrations, we use the best practices. And no more of these problematic findings in books, we focus on register reports, evidence, and learning from them in order to uh, do better. If you want to see what my courses look like, everything is open, this is my syllabus. Uh, it's a, a 30 pages long syllabus. Uh, and the reason why it's so long is because this is a contract. So students who join me in my class uh, need to adhere and understand the, the, the contract. They have a quiz on the syllabus at the end of the ad drop period where I need to see that they have understood the process because there is a lot of uncertainty. This is not how they're used to uh, learning. And it requires a certain kind of, of mindset. It's very, very important for this to succeed, to set expectations well in advance and to allow them to drop and move to a different instructor if they feel like it. So you can take everything that we've done, adopt this, uh, run this uh, your own. By now, we have a lot of resources. We have collaborative templates. We have guides, um, everything that you need. You can just click on those and see all, everything that we've, that we've done. If you need to run a replication and extension, if you need to do a register report, just uh, we have a template for our main manuscript and a supplementary. We also have a template for how students review each other and so forth. What did we do? We concluded uh, about a hundred of these. Right now we have the findings for uh, 72 of these uh, pre-registered replications and extensions. We ran this mostly on MTurk and Prolific and a little bit with Hong Kong uh, samples. This allowed us, I did not have a big budget. I had my basic uh, seed funding coming to HKU, which I completely uh, uh, spent, then no longer anything left from that. So about 55,000 US dollars, about $1 per participant. And I want you to really uh, contemplate a little bit about the success rate. So if you recall at the beginning when I chose judgment decision-making, I wasn't really sure what the replication rate is going to be. 
Um, so at the very least, having a 60, 68, 70% replication rate is reassuring for me, plus this 13%, but some works, some doesn't, you know, so one hypothesis work, one hypothesis doesn't work, uh, one DV work, one DV doesn't work. So that's, that's already a little bit more reassuring for judgment decision making compared to all the other things in social psychology, the exact sciences. So it seems like there's something about judgment decision making, you know, need, need to consider this as preliminary evidence because it's not random and it's not systematic. But from what we've read of classics in judgment decision making, it seems to be a little bit more uh, solid. But I want you to consider something else. Before I ran this, when I told people I'm going to run things with undergraduates in Hong Kong on Amazon Mechanical Turk and uh, British Prolific, and I am a first year assistant professor, early career researcher at HKU in Hong Kong. People are, were like, this is never gonna work. This is not how you run replications. Students, undergraduates on MTurk, what is this Hong Kong, you say HKU? So people were uh, pessimistic to the point of sometimes being a little bit hostile. So judgment and decision-making aside, what you see here is remarkable in that these students were able to do 100 replications of classic findings in judgment decision-making with a very high replicability rate. And even in the things that didn't work in the mixed, inconclusive, and unsuccessful, they've identified errors in the original classics from the 70s and 80s. Nobody has ever looked at these statistics, so they found errors, misalignments between the tables, the figures, and the tests. The, uh, the text, sometimes statistical tests that make no, no sense, uh, effect sizes are completely uh, unreasonable. Uh, sometimes we communicated with, uh, with authors and people are saying, you know, this was published 40 years ago. Nobody has ever told me that there's a, a problem in the article. So just imagine undergraduate analyzing for the first time, really looking in depth at statistics, all the insights that we gained both from the successful and the unsuccessful just blew my mind. The stuff that these students were able to do, I just, uh, unbelievable. Uh, we also ran uh, registered reports. Um, so we have uh, a few of these registered reports stage, uh, stage one. But I think one of the nicest things that came out of this, and you can use all of that, is that I decided rather than me telling them how to run replications and extensions, I told them I'm going to open a Google Doc and we're going to write these guides together. So by now you can see we have how to run replications and extensions, how to do RGMOV, how to do extensions, how to calculate effect size, how to do Qualtrics. It's not me, this is a collaborative Google Doc. You can go in and edit this yourself and anybody that edits and contributes something meaningfully and adds their name at the beginning saying, I contributed this, when we submit this to the journals, you're a co-author. So everything is open, everything is collaborative. If I would do this on my own, it would be five pages, six pages, but some of these are hundreds of pages long and they're not updated by me. You know, and keeping things up to date, finding errors, you really need a community. So everything that we do is Google Docs, everything is open, everything is uh, collaborative. Anybody uh, can go and, 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 and join us. Everything I, I post on Twitter and I invite people to come in and, and join us. So it's rather just been me. It's the entire open science movement uh, creating these resources. How, how successful were we? So look at what these students have been able to achieve. In 2020, we've published 12 of these. You can see the model here is that I am at the end. Uh, my TA is a little bit after me. Then all of these underlined are students. Undergraduate students are published in some of our uh, you know, top journals in social psychology, some of this in economics. And then at the beginning, there's this uh, early career researcher. And as you can see, the star means that the early career researcher and the students are shared first author. So by leveraging this, it's a bit like a Wikipedia of early career researchers and students working together to publish this replication. So not only did they complete something and then we threw it into the file drawer, we take all that the students are doing, or upload this to the Open Science Framework, invite early career researchers that we don't know out there on Twitter and say, please come and join us, take over, verify everything, and then help us uh, bring this to the journals. We have a lot of preprints as well in 2020. We're only in April. 
in 2021, but we already, you know, even with the pandemic, we keep going strong and things keep coming out. So we had these two publications just came out and a bunch of preprints that are keep coming out. So this early career research is really uh, very, very uh, enthusiastic, uh, very supportive of each other. We have a Slack where they, you know, they keep, keep, uh, uh, um, reviewing each other and, and offering uh, insights. And it's really nice to see everything kind of coming together and all these students really uh, benefiting from a one, one semester course at HKU as an undergraduate. So informing the scientific community, not just you know, passively learning, tell, tell us what the truth is. The students are really contributing to, to the community, to the scientific community. Uh, I don't know, I don't think I have uh, a lot of uh, time left. So I'm gonna, gonna wrap it up uh, over here. Um, I'm just gonna say there's lots of slides. There's like a, a hundred of these, uh, a lot of examples. So you can uh, click on any of those. Uh, you have the slides, just go and, and look at everything. All that I've talked about today, first you have the slides so you can uh, go and uh, look uh, on the links by yourself. But if you want a summary, of all my open science journey, of everything that we've done with the undergraduates, the 100 replications, all the register reports, the meta-analyses, uh, all the things that we've accomplished uh, in the last uh, two years. If you want to use our templates, our guides, if you want to contribute and become a collaborator, if you want to join us as an early career researcher taking our completed manuscripts, you just need one link, and this is the link over here. So click this or scan this, go on our website, see what we've done, see if anything um, fits your preferences. Uh, we want as much as possible to help you do well in your open science journey. Uh, very happy to talk to any of you, whatever stage of career you're, uh, you're on. So this is my email. You can contact me directly. I'm very active on uh, Twitter. We also have a mailing list where we update about our workshops, about our templates, um, guides, and also about our publication preprints and, and everything else. So this is a good way to keep up to date. So thank you very much. I know this was a lot in a very, very short time. Um, hopefully I can come back and, and visit and talk about these things more in the future. Thanks. You know, that was uh, very inspiring. And what, what, what you achieved, I think, is, uh, is, is quite remarkable um, from a open science for the you know education you know drawing students in, into these projects is brilliant and 